In this video, I will talk about infant botulism. Infant botulism is an acute flaccid paralysis which occur in infants younger than one year old. It is caused by a neurotoxin which is produced by a bacterium Clostridium botulinum and related species such as Clostridium butyricum and Clostridium baryti. The bacterium Clostridium botulinum is a gram-positive spore-forming obligate anaerobe. Its natural habitat are soil, dust, air, water and marine sediments. It is found in fresh and cooked agricultural products including raw honey and all canned foods. Botulinum toxin is the most poisonous substance known and the lethal toxin dose is as low as 1 microgram per kilogram. Now, 8 antigenic toxin types have been recognized and the infant botulism is most commonly caused by the type A and type B. 95% cases of infant botulism occur between 3 weeks to 6 months of age. But it has occurred in 1 and a half day old to 382 days old infants. Male-female ratio is equal and it occurs in all racial and ethnic groups. Now I will discuss the risk factor for infant botulism. Breastfeeding has a controversial role because 70% of the affected infants are breastfed. Ingestion of raw honey is also an important risk factor. Slow intestinal transit time that is less than one stool per day is also a risk factor for infant botulism. Other risk factors include ingestion of untreated well water, powdered milk, natural sweeteners, corn syrup and medicinal herbs. Now you must be thinking that why only infants less than 12 months of age are affected by infant botulism. This is because they have an immature immune system lack gastric acidity and have diminished bacterial flora. All these three factors contribute to the growth and proliferation of Clostridium botulinum in their gut. Now I will discuss the pathogenesis of infant botulism. After ingestion, the Clostridium botulinum spores germinate and multiply in the large intestine of the baby. There they produce botulinum toxin and this toxin is carried via the bloodstream to the peripheral cholinergic synapses. Now the toxin binds irreversibly with the presynaptic nerve terminal and is internalized. Now within the presynaptic neuron, the botulinum toxin blocks the calcium channels and prevents the release of acetylcholine. This decreased level of acetylcholine at the neuromuscular junction leads to flaccid paralysis. Now the botulinum toxin first affects the bulbar musculature and then the somatic musculature. And in this autonomic transmission is also impaired. Now healing process results from sprouting of new terminal unmyelinated motor neurons. These new ticks re innervate the non-contracting muscles by inducing the formation of motor end plate. Now I will discuss the clinical presentation of infant botulism. Classic features of infant botulism are acute onset of symmetric flaccid descending paralysis with clear sensorium, no fever and no paresthesia. Now I will discuss the important clues in history. Incubation period is about 10 to 30 days and decreased frequency or absence of defecation is usually first noticed by the parents. There is inability to feed because of progressive weak suck. Cry is also weak or hoarse and there is dysphagia and secretions keep drooling from the mouth. There is also flattened facial expression. Other clues in history include unfocused eyes, diminished spontaneous movements, symmetric descending weakness and floppiness and in severe cases breathing may be shallow due to respiratory suppression. Now on physical examination of the infant, Gag, suck and corneal reflexes are diminished. There is oculomotor palsy and decreased ocular motility. There is also metriasis and the pupillary light reflux is sluggish. There is bilateral ptosis and bilateral facial weakness. There is prominent head lag and hypotonia. On physical examination, there is also bilateral extremity weakness and truncal weakness. Urinary retention may be present because of bladder palsy. Anal sphincter tone is relaxed and decreased. Deep tendon reflexes are either diminished or normal. 
Sensations are intact but these are difficult to elicit because of hypotonia and the mental status is preserved. It is important to remember that in infant botulism, sudden respiratory arrest can occur because of airway occlusion by unsolid secretions and obstructive flaccid pharyngeal musculature. Now, common complications of infant botulism include syndrome of inappropriate secretion of antidiuretic hormone, autonomic instability such as hypotension, apnea, urinary tract infection, pneumonia, sepsis, otitis media, seizures due to electrolyte imbalance such as hyponatremia, and respiratory arrest. Now I will discuss the diagnosis. Infant botulism is a clinical diagnosis. Routine lab studies are normal, including CSF examination, but it is important to do lumbar puncture to rule out meningitis. In order to confirm diagnosis, both a stool culture and a direct toxin assays are required. Toxin assays are done in stool, serum or gastric contents and stool culture is done with enema fluid or feces. Stool samples should be taken in a sterile container without any preservatives and it can be stored in a refrigerator but should not be frozen. Now direct toxin assay results are available the next morning and the stool culture results can vary from one week to one month. However, only 60% of stool culture yield a positive result. PCR assays are available in some hospitals. These detect spores and the results are available within 24 to 72 hours. Now, uh, no imaging is required to make the diagnosis of infant botulism and the brain and the spinal cord imaging is normal. However, chest x-ray can show aspiration pneumonia. Now, electromyography show a characteristic pattern in infant botulism. It is brief, small, abundant motor unit action potential. Nerve conduction velocities and sensory nerve functions are normal in infant botulism. Now, I will discuss the treatment of infant botulism. First, assess and stabilize airway breathing and circulation. Careful monitoring and intensive care unit care is important. 50% cases of infant botulism require intubation and an advanced airway and ventilatory support. Now, until the diagnosis is confirmed by history and clinical examination, continue supportive care. Now, the correct positioning. Place the infant face up on a rigid bottom crib or bed, tilt head head of the bed at 20 to 30 degrees and place a small cloth roll under the neck to tilt the head back. With this position, the airway secretions will be drained away from the airway back into the pharynx and the abdominal musculatures will be pulled down and this will improve the respiratory mechanics. Botulism immune globulin intravenous is recommended for the treatment of infant botulism. The dose is 50 to 100 mg per kilogram and it is given in a single intravenous infusion. It should be given as soon as possible after the infant botulism is suspected and the treatment should not be delayed for laboratory confirmation. Now, antibiotics should not be given in uncomplicated infant botulism and these are only reserved for secondary infections. This is because the antibiotics cause lysis of the bacterium and there is more release of the botulinum toxin. Now, non clostridial antibiotics such as trimethoprine sulfamethoxazole should be preferred. And aminoglycoside antibiotics should totally be avoided because they potentiate the blocking action of botulinum toxin at the neuromuscular junctions. Now, feeding is also important as the infant is unable to take orally, nasogastric or nasogeginal tube feeding can be done. Express breast milk is the best choice because it contains secretory immunoglobulin A, lactoferrin and leukocytes. Now tube feeding also assists in restoration of the peristalsis and relieve constipation. However, intravenous feeding should be avoided. Now as the mental status and sensations are intact in infant botulism, auditory, tactile and visual stimulation is beneficial and avoid sedatives and CNS depressants. Now it is important to maintain adequate hydration in these cases. Now for constipation, stool softeners such as lactulose can be given. 
However, cathartics are not recommended and care should be taken in handling and disposing the infant excreta. Now, in case of bladder palsy, gentle suprapubic pressure with the infant in sitting position and head supported is usually beneficial. Now, prognosis of infant botulism is generally good with early recognition and administration of human botulism immune globulin intravenous. After discharge, infant need to follow up with neurology department and physical therapy. Now, most cases result in complete recovery within several months to a year. Now, following resolution of the illness, all live virus vaccines should be delayed by 5 months and strict hand washing and special handling of the soiled diapers of the baby should be practiced because toxin is shed for weeks to months. Now, important differential diagnoses of infant botulism and hypotonia in infants include sepsis, CNS infection such as meningitis and encephalitis, electrolyte disturbance such as hyponatremia, hypothyroidism, organophosphate poisoning, heavy metal poisoning, poliomyelitis, metabolic disorder and encephalopathy, subacute necrotizing encephalomyelitis, spinal muscular atrophy type 1, congenital myopathy, congenital myasthenia gravis, guillain barre syndrome, and tick paralysis. Thanks for watching this video. Please like, share, comment, and subscribe to my YouTube channel.